written in like uh, a Futhor or a High Frisian that actually is was a a kind of old English magical spell involving eels. And um, eels had like a lot of unique symbology and kind of interest when it came to uh, a lot of early Europe because we had no idea where they bred. The European eel, we had literally no idea. Every fisherman that caught one, there was never any eggs, never any sexual organs. They literally just appeared. And they had absolutely no idea. Fast forward, we had suspicions for a long time that they actually go out to sea and go out to the Sargassum Sea and then like breed out there and then the like offspring come back. But it wasn't until 2014 when we actually put a tracking device on one and actually proved that that's what occurred. So just to let you know, we solved the problem that was from like the fifth, sixth century. Um, there was a lot to be said for eels. They were eaten regularly. They actually live about 30 years. That would be the European eel. The American eel is very similar. Um, the American eel, FYI, is endangered. No. If you catch one, don't catch them. Um, let, them let them go again. Uh, American eels can be found all, all throughout both the Americas. Um, you need some time for, for to talk. Yes. Okay. Well, just feel free whenever you're ready. Um, all right, let's see. All right, so the English name eel descends from the old English ale, uh, and angia, the ia, is actually eel, and angua is actually a root word for snake. It's a snake eel. That's where angia comes from. That's the old, like, uh, the old Greek for it. Um, so, I'm gonna throw this out and see what everybody thinks. What defines an eel? If you had to have a characteristic, you said, this, this one thing all eels have, does anyone have any ideas? Lack of things? A lack of fins. A serpentine body. Serpentine body. <clears throat> the jaws are different. Any other thoughts? You talk of true eels or spiny eels? Well, because arguably, true, true eels don't have scales. True eels don't have scales, so we have scaleless. So, as we can see. And when we start actually applying these, it is almost a guarantee that something will break that. Honestly, I had a one of the workers here, and I was actually pitching it, and he was like, "I've got one. It has a work. It doesn't have a, or it, it has a working jaw." And I was like, "Oh, you're a pump." I was not going to pick him until the last, because he said he was going to come up, and I was like, "No, I'm not going to pick you." But yes, they. Usually, uh, working jaws is something that all eels would have, uh, but arguably, yeah, serpentine body, um, you know, uh, secondary set of jaws is something that mores have, but and other various deep sea eels, but something that you wouldn't see in a spiny eel. Um, fins, some eels have, but as we can see with the moray, they lack all fins. So it gets really complicated. Some have scales, some don't. It gets, it's really all over the board. Um, so we talked about the American eel. American eel and, and European eel are both really similar. Um, they live about, they can live about 30 years. Um, they actually have multiple stages of their life form. It gets really complicated. I've heard that they're really tasty when they're at a glass eel stage. <laughs> you cook a bunch of them up and they call them elvers. Suffice it to say, 
because they are both threatened, um, remember that they are moving from the sea into fresh water, so dams and things like that can really create problems for them. Like literally, you will sever off the ability for eels to get upstream. But the uh, in Spain, because they're kind of regulated, there is a black market for elvers. So suffice it to say, Spanish mafiosos, if you're ever in Portugal or Spain, and you're cooking elvers in some weird backwoods spot, you're probably dealing with some pretty shady characters. <laughs> if you didn't know, now you know. Um, okay, so let's jump into mores. All right, so moray eels. Here is our a freshwater moray. Most morays are actually salt. Uh, they're actually marine. Um, they're gonna stay pretty much marine their entire life. Um, a few weirdos occasionally wander in. Um, there is one that's usually, you'll see is a freshwater moray. Um, which is gymnothorax tile, or the Indian mud moray. They're generally born in fresh water and will slowly transition to full marine by about 12 inches or so. Um, they actually have harder and harder, more difficult time staying in fresh water longer. Now, the, har the harder the water, the more alkaline it is, the higher the pH, the longer that they can probably stay in fresh water. So the more acidic it is, the less time. Remember that these are kind of brackish water inhabitants, so they're gonna naturally kind of gravitate toward that. Um, I would generally recommend with a tile, uh, freshwater uh, Indian mud moray, that you kind of shift over into a full marine's tank probably fairly short. It, it, they generally don't do great in fresh water long term. I have seen the once in a blue moon cases where somebody just really dedicates the time, but at some point it's just not a good inhabitant for a freshwater system. Okay, there is a few references to gymnothorax aper, which is the African dark moray. I have never seen that fish available for sale. Um, I've only seen a few references to them being caught in brackish over in like West Africa. They look super cool. I'm not gonna lie, I, I saw some pictures online. They look really neat, but I don't think that that's probably a long-term one. Most of the pictures all look like they're in the reef. I doubt that they would survive long-term in brackish. Um, there is an oddball that's actually found near the Indian mud moray in the same sort of habitat, and that is the pink-lipped moray, the Echidna rhodochilus. Super cool looking moray. Dude, it's gonna need really like full marine. Um, the only oddball that seems to tolerate full fresh their entire life is the gymnothorax poly polyuronidon, the freshwater tiger, or leopard moray. They're actually found on a couple of odd islands and they seem to actually stay entirely in freshwater their entire lifespan. Um, usually they can be a little bit picky to get eating, but once they do kind of pick it up, now I will say that cost can be insane. Usually that's always a good determiner if you're looking at a freshwater eel and you're a freshwater moray and you're like, am I dealing with the one that's actually caught in freshwater or am I dealing with the one that's kind of brackish? The brackish one usually runs about $10 to $15. These at like 12 inches run about three to 400. At two foot would run well beyond. It's gonna be noticeable in price. You're gonna go, whoa, whoa. Whoa, wow, that's a really expensive moray. Okay, so there is an oddball, um, it's part of the spaghetti eel family. It's a purple spaghetti eel. 
Um, they get about 18 inches. They're actually found in India. Um, they're slightly brackish to fresh, but they can actually tolerate kind of hard water, especially hard, hard water. Um, they do fairly well. They're kind of expensive, and getting them to start eating is a trick. They usually like shrimp, and they like live shrimp. So do, as long as you're happy going to collect some ghost shrimp out of the local ditch, they will be super happy. Dude, if you're trying to feed them frozen, a lot of fish that are wild caught just don't understand what frozen is. They don't eat dead things in the wild. They just avoid dead things. Dead things are usually bad, especially for predators. If a bunch of dead stuff is all in an area, the predator goes, hey, this is dangerous. The, the water's probably hypoxic. I'm gonna go somewhere else. Dude, yeah, dude, weird dead things just floating around randomly in the water is a bad idea. A weird corpse is one thing, but they smell it and they kind of go hunting for that corpse. So usually that's half the trick to getting them to eat is getting some fresher food and then they can kind of slowly pick up the habit of eating. But in the wild, they would naturally avoid large pockets of huge dead things just laying everywhere. They'd be like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die if I go over It's bad. Okay. So the next group is our spiny eels. All right, so these are spiny eels. They actually get the name from that long set of spines that go up their back. If you actually see, they can actually flex it and they'll actually pop it out. So if you see that dorsal ridge on these, it's huge. And they all are, so they evolved shortly before really uh, you had Asia and Africa split because they're found in both Africa and in Asia. They used to actually had they had the Africans separated into Afra Mastos and Bellis, but and then they actually had another little clade of blind ones called Seco Mastos and Bellis. But ichthyologists that are paid way more than me went, you're silly. I think you're, you're, you're breaking up these things silly, and I would like to see your research. And they went, fine, they're all Mastus and Bellis. So now they're all back to Mastus and Bellis. So um, they all are kind of loosely related. Um, there are two genuses out of Asia that seem to have like beard, and we have two different small genuses. Um, Macrognathus is our smaller dwarves. Um, those are our peacock, zebra spiny eels, yellow tail eels, half banded, uh, red tails. Um, a lot of these stay in about the 6 to 12 inch range and are actually fairly tolerant. Now, I will say that spiny eels, as a general group, like to vary. They generally will get up underneath the substrate with their head poking out. Once they get to a fairly large size, like some of these, they're no longer prey. But small things that look like worms generally get eaten in a lake. <laughs> it's best to hide in caves, and usually in small little burrows. If you ever see them in a shop, usually they're in a piece of PVC and they're all jammed up in there. They'll oftentimes call those a wor uh, an eel burrow or an eel bin. Uh, weirdly, eels like to hang out and group all together. Um, so Macrognathus is a good kind of group. I would probably recommend this for like a general, like small community tank. If you actually had those, they're generally not going to eat anything that is going to be like prey. I doubt it. I would be surprised that they would take down guppies, even baby guppies. I honestly, they're mostly worm eaters. They're going to like eat blood worms. They're just going to kind of keep them themselves. You ready? Uh, oh, yeah, that's my jacket. Just, just toss them wherever. So he's going to feed them. So, and honestly, if you guys want to come up and take a seat or whatever, I can scream too. It's all good. 
So this is QB, and QB is going to be hand feeding our eels today. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, just chopped up gold shrimp. It is their favorite. If I dump this all, it should be gone in 30 seconds. How often do you feed them? Oh, I think like every night. Yeah. Yeah, usually around five, so they might not know it's feeding time. Uh, no, they know it's feeding time. <laughs> I was going to say, Mike said he wasn't going to feed them for a couple days to get them nice and hungry. And usually if you bring it to them, they'll actually take it right out of your hand. You know, usually whenever I'm working with an initial eel, I will take either earthworms or something and show it and bring it up to the top and it will literally fall up the worm and then take it out of your hand. They're usually very smart and they'll live for many, many years. They can be really personal. I mean, fire eels can get up to about three foot as adults. So it's a pretty massive uh, fish. Uh, now the al the xanthic back here. There's been some arguments. I'll I'll bump into it um, as to its species. So our next group is our mastis Um uh, Now mastis umbellus is a larger group. It's got uh, about 45 species in Africa and about 15 in Asia. Most are found in rivers or associated systems, um, but there are some that are in like lacustre lakes. Lake Tanganyika has 15 unique massive symbolid eels alone by itself. There's unique species found in Malawi. There's a rose colored one that's kind of a weird magenta pink that is highly sought after. Whenever I see them end up on the market, they end up going for like a fairly ridiculous sum. Um, and they're only about six to 12 inches, but I've seen them push three to 400 sometimes at certain auctions. Because there's only a few of them that end up making it out, especially with that good, gorgeous rose color that everybody really wants. Oh, yeah. How old are they for this size? For this size? They're probably about three to four years old at this size, but they're also likely have been raised in a pond and pond fed. I'm guessing to get bulked up like that. So I have one. It's tire track, though, not Oh, yeah. It's like this big. Oh, yeah. Yeah, tire tracks are. I so said tire tracks are our bigger cousin. They actually can get 48 inches. So they get another foot. Yes. they mature is bigger than tire. Yeah, really, the tire track is the largest of the, the masses yeah, and belts. Like, that's the biggest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they can get stout. They're stout fish. Um, okay, so we've got the tire track, the zigzag, the tire track or the zigzag. Um, we've got the fire eels. There is a massive symbolus unicolor, which is kind of unique. Imagine a fire eel, but imagine that the red and the oranges were gone. So you have these kind of streaks, and it's uh, referred to as unicolor. So, weirdly, whenever we were trying to identify, when all of a sudden we got flooded with xanthic fire eels. These are xanthic, all right, so, um, does everybody know what xanthism is? All right, if, if everyone does, I, oh. All right, so, we're, we're just gonna talk about it. So we've got, you know what an albino is? Mm -hmm. And um, xanthism is something that we actually see in the fish community. Sometimes you also see it in reptiles. We usually don't see it in humans or mammals, but occasionally it occurs. Xanthism is basically a lack of all pigmentation except for yellows, yellows and oranges. So have you ever seen a red or a gold severum or a, a, an orange severum? That's a xanthic. That's actually a xanthic form. So it's an odd form. Um, our xanthic eel right here, we believe is actually Massis umbellus unicolor and not the actual fire eel. We think that that's actually where they popped up and that's why we don't normally see them. But occasionally we do see unicolor. Um, I've seen them on a handful of German markets, but I don't see them very commonly here. But uh, to, to be honest, a lot of times when we are looking on 
distributor sheets and stuff in the US, they will list spiny eel. Spiny eel. And you go, oh wow, boy, we've only got 110 species to guess. Which one is it? And they go, it's a spiny eel. And you go, God, where did they come from? They go, Asia? Question mark. And you're like, what? We don't even know what continent it came from. And they go, it's a spiny eel. <laughs> you go, ah. So oftentimes, it isn't until we get them in and actually see them that we can actually identify. Like literally, I, it is a common problem in the hobby. I mean, Matt can testify. How many times we've, we've ordered something and you go, what is that? And they go, it's a panda tetra. And you're like, what, what is a panda tetra? And they go, Pan panda tetra. And you go, he send a picture and you go like, man, it looks like a, a lot like a dawn tetra. And they go, you, you could call it that. And you're like, dude, that is a dawn tetra. Dude, you just changed the name because panda sells. Ah, stop that. <laughs> Suffice it to say it happens. Um, okay, so it, there is one of the spine eels is found down in the Congo River. The Congo River is a real, real, real deep river. Usually deep fresh water actually becomes anaerobic, so you don't actually find fish there. It's not like the ocean where like really, real deep, you know, deep in Lake Tanganyika, there's nothing there. there uh, I mean, like literally there's blood worms. It's the only thing that can live down in that real, real low oxygen. And then they come up as huge clouds. And yeah, you get these huge storms of, of uh, like flies that are erupting out of Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi because they're so deep. But you're not getting the actual like flow that's needed to actually turn up that bottom and get oxygen down there. But if you take a river like the Congo that's cutting, it's cutting so deep, it actually gets, so it's super deep. And weirdly, our only blind spiny eels are found at the bottom of the Congo River, which is also the only spot where we find our only troglodytic or blind uh, cichlids, which are actually a Shelly relative. It's actually a Lamprologus. They're, they're neat. Every once in a while you see them. They're cool. Um, okay. We also find them in Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi. I will say that almost all of the African spiny eels are really expensive and really tough to get. A lot of hardcore tang keepers and Malawi tank keepers kind of snatch them up because they want anything out of that lake that is not a cichlid. And these are kind of that <coughs> crown jewel to throw in that tank. You know, you're like, oh, cool, look. And you, yeah, you've got a couple spiny eels. There are some pretty zebras and stripe patterns that are just gorgeous. Um, there's a starry night that's out of Tanganyika that's really pretty as well. Um, all right, and then our last oddball is Cinnabella, which is what they call an earthworm eel. Um, and they're a bit unique uh, out of China. They kind of have a unique shape to their face and a fusion of their body. And they're part of the spiny eel group, but they're actually different than Macarnathus and Massus and Bellus. But they're all kind of part of that same group. Okay, so the next one, next group of eels, um, I used to keep whenever I was a kid before they made them illegal here in Texas. <laughs> which are the tulip eels or the swamp eels. It's kind of like this really, really ugly looking moray that just doesn't do a whole lot. Um, they ate everything that would you throw at them and they breathed air. Suffice it to say, they got loose in Florida and now everybody in the South is like, no, 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 no. They are, they're currently very common in Florida and there's a, probably a good chance that eventually at some point in our life, we will probably see them if they can just cross the Mississippi. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're very, very invasive. So 
I fully expect one day to see this. Um, on the positive side, they're very good eating. They are, they're highly consumed over in like Southeast Asia. So they're, they're just like snakeheads, an excellent food fish. Um, all right, so the next group, we're gonna talk about the, eh, remember that we're, we're, we're being very vague on eels. Did, this is long and serpentine, we're gonna call it eel. The next one would be a rope fish, which is actually part of the polypterid group. It's its own kind of unique cousin, and he's the last little bitty oddball amongst the polypterids. The other polypterids are the bickers, and they're, they're big, meatier, meaner cousins. Rope fish are really kind of passive, you know, like it, I've seen guppies push them out of the way of food, and they're like, oh no, you know, and they <laughs> swim away. <laughs> Bigger ornates will just eat everything. Dude, I've seen them chew the back legs off turtles. And dude, it didn't drown the turtle. Like, it, they're, they're no joke. I've seen them eat arowanas. I had one eat a striped Raphael, and I was like, okay, you don't, you're not allowed to have friends no more. You can't, you, you've, lost, you've lost friend capability. You're just gonna live by yourself and be me. Um, but oftentimes, you'll hear those referred to as dinosaur eels. Um, so I don't know why. They have ganoid scales, so they're real, real hard. Um, most of the, the people in Africa are like, they don't even want to eat them because they're just getting through the scales is a pain. Little dull, dull knives, and they're like, dude, yeah, just throw them back. They're arguably a, lo a lot like similar to our shoe pick or our amia calva, our bowfin. Um, which, yeah, most people, grinnell, I don't know. It's a weird old fish and it's found here in America. Suffice to say, they're really mean, but they're the, all the rage over in Europe. If you wanna make some money to export both into Europe or to Southeast Asia, it, they are hungry for those in gar, because they don't have gar. Gar only found here in America. <clears throat> so dude, if they want super cool gar, dude, where are they gonna get an alligator gar? And get it from here. Weirdly, nobody collects fish and exports them here. So you don't, the few people that do, you still have actually, to have a license. So you do have to have a and license. I don't think takes the fish and wildlife. True, but if you breed them <laughs> on your own, then usually yeah. that's the trick. Um, the next thing that I would kind of consider eel-like is uh, lungfish. There's a whole bunch of lungfish, so I'll try to kind of cover them all. There's a big South American species. That one would be what I would kind of consider the most eel-like. You guys agree? Yeah. All of our lungfish aficionados. The Daloy, uh, they've kind of got a darker body with a couple of yellow speckles. Um, they do have limbs. They have kind of tentacle arms. Um, they use those arms to kind of Buy, buy themselves in the water. They'll generally eat anything and they will bite. They will bite you, do, do not play around. But on the positive side, they can breathe air. So dude, you can do 100% water changes. No joke. Like drain it, dude, they'll squirm around for a little bit, start filling the tank again. Dude, you're good to go. Dude, it will be fine and happy. Usually they live about 75 to 100 years. So dude, you, you can will them to your children. <laughs> the Australian lungfish can push about 150 years. Yeah, so that one is the Queen, Queensland or the Australian. Um, it is highly like endangered, but they do have a CITES listed pond that they're breeding them from, and every once in a while we do see imports. So it's all fish. It is. But they do get six foot. So, dude, FYI, six foot, lives 150 years. <laughs> Choose you're, wisely. You're, 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 you're walking into a certain thing. As long as we're all good. Um, but there's some smaller ones. Um, a lot of the ones in Africa uh, are actually about in the three to four foot range, but there is the gilled lungfish that only gets to about, I want to say 10 to 12 inches. And it looks like a 
weird hybrid of like a lungfish and an axolotl had a weird baby, but like has like external gills. They're really odd. They're a little expensive, but if you're wanting a lungfish and you just had to have one and you wanted the most reasonable one, that would probably be the one that I would hunt. Okay, next up, uh, Gymnotidae. So this is what we call our electric eel, which is not really an eel. It's a naked back knife fish from South America. The black ghost is in the same family along with the brown ghost and the centipede knives and the elephant nose knives and the trumpet knives, the mouse knives, there's a whole bunch. Uh, the reason that they actually call them naked back is to differentiate them from the feather back knives, which would be nocterids. Nocteridae are the ferret feather backs, and that's because they have a dorsal fin. That would be your clown knives out of Asia. So these are the Asiatic and African knives. The gymnotids don't have a dorsal fin. There goes naked back knife fish. So that's, where, that's how you differentiate it. Um, they are all electroforms, so they all generate electricity. Um, the electric eel is just really, 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 really good at it. Um, all the other ones do as well. They sense, they will actually ignore their own eyesight in favor of their electric sensation. That's it. Have you ever seen a little black ghost ho house? It's a little clear tube because black ghosts hide all the time. Um, they will literally go into the tube and because they're pulsing with that electricity, they can actually feel that it's coming and hitting something. So they know that something's there. So they're ignoring their eyesight of seeing light because they feel something there. So you can see they will literally ignore their own vision because their electric field is that good. So they actually hunt and do a lot of that kind of. So um, a lot of the, the knives could be kind of considered eels eel like some of the knife fish are really kind of passive some of them are a little bit touchy i usually have good luck with ghosts but i mean black ghosts get two foot no joke and dude they're really really not tolerant of other knives they don't like a lot other electric fish in the same tank with them just suffice it to say it's kind of like you know wheeze in their juice it makes them mad. Eventually, they will. There will be murder. I've tried it a few times. I tell them it's going to work out until it doesn't, and then it's going to be really bad. And usually, there's a 12-inch dead black ghost, and they go, "What happened?" And I go, "Yesterday was the day, dude. After three years, that was the day that that other knife fish said no more, and it, he will literally shred them in the tank. Yeah." Um, but they're actually a fairly solid fish. Some of the smaller ones, the brown ghost is actually a really cool fish that I think gets overlooked. And for its size, it is amazing. It stays in that six to seven inch range that you can kind of keep in like a lot of like just small community tanks. And they're not nearly as difficult to feed as some of the green knives, you know, that uh, just the transparent clear knives have a tough time with them they're really difficult to get to eat and their longevity in the hobby I never see them last more than like six months to a year I just I don't I wish I did but um, all right next up so we've talked about night fish suffice it to say there was a weird elephant nose relative that decided to go the completely different route the knife fish actually evolved the anal fin to be the long one. Their, the weird African relative of the more myrid actually evolved a dorsal fin. And that is the aba aba. Um, aba abas are super weird. There's nothing like an aba aba. Um, they hit about four feet and from all records and like personnel that I've talked to that have kept them, they bite and they draw blood bite. Like it is no joke bite. Um, they're extremely aggressive. They're aggressive with their keepers. Putting your hand in the tank will cause them to attack you. So 
but they're super cool looking. I'm not gonna lie. Every time I see one, I'm like, did I like all my like that like little voice in the back of the head that says, Roy, you can't have this. I'm like, I I think I could do that. <laughs> and my my wife goes, No, you can't. Stop stop that. Stop that. <laughs> um. All right. Next up, loaches. Really, we don't think of loaches as eels, but dude, arguably, dude, if you're looking for a three-inch eel, dude, a coolie loach is absolutely what you need. It's perfect. I love a coolie loach. Don't worry, other eels have fins. Dude, it's all good. Dude, eel is just kind of relative term. Um, dojos are another good one. If you can find a fork-tailed loach, they are even more serpentine. Imagine a jet black loach with like a neon orange stripe running down its back, going back to a really long fork tail. They're really cool. I don't see them enough in the hobby. I've only seen them like twice, and you, every time I start drooling, like, I'm not gonna lie, they're, they're super gorgeous. I love that fish. Um, all right, next up is one of our own little weird natives. Uh, when you're dragging way out towards Galveston and you get in a really brackish water, and you come up with something that looks like some alien. And dude, that is the dragon goby. Um, dragon goby's about two foot. They're actually a sand sifter. So dude, as scary as they look, they literally are, have a tiny little throat. So they have a difficult time with food. Um, they really need to stay in brackish and really moving them towards marine is even better. Um, I've heard some fairly successful individuals with larger fish onlys in a marine system and really fine sand actually have fairly good luck with them as a sand sifter instead of a dragon or a, a diamond goat. So we just don't normally think of them that way. Um, the one that Jared had biggest issues with was a, a weirdo that was found in a cave in India uh, back in 2014. Um, they were, they found the only troglodytic or cave dwelling, um, snakehead. And that is Enigmochana golem or the golem snakehead. And they're really spooky looking. They don't call them a golem snakehead for nothing. Uh, but again, dude, it's very serpentine. Um, likely it has a lot of influx of other fish coming in. I think that would be the only reason that a cave fish could support that large of a predatory base to have actually evolved. Um, let's see. All right, there is an eel-tailed catfish. There's whole bunches of them. Like I could go through them. There's a Wells cat that's over in Europe that's insane. Like you, when you see these Wells cats pulled up, we're talking 10, 12 foot. They're crazy and they've got kind of like a long eel-like tail. Um, there's one out of Australia that's an eel tail cat. Uh, there is a walking catfish that's actually an eel catfish. Um, it's really long but it's it's a walking cat so they're banned in all 50. Uh, I didn't make the rules. Um, so we can't go across this thing. we just go over it? Yeah. Yeah. Take the bypass. Hey, I'll tell you what, honestly, I was looking at coolie loaches at a local shop and I went, hey, what catfish is that? And he said, there's no catfish in there. And I said, oh, okay, there's about 30 little coolie loaches that are all piled up together and in the middle of that big pile is a catfish. And he went, that's not a catfish. Well, huh, it's weird. What, what do you think that is? And I was like, dude, it looks like a walking catfish. And he goes, is that expensive? And I said, dude, in fines, it's illegal in all 50 states. And he went, well, I didn't order that. And I said, no, you probably didn't. He probably got put into the bag when they bagged up the coolie loaches over in Malaysia. And he has been eating his way through coolie loaches all the way over. But I would probably go ahead and just put him in the freezer and call him done. And he said, that's probably a good idea. Um, let's see. Pipefish. Uh, pipefish, I could, I, could, I could call that eel-like. 
they, they kind of are serpentine, they move around. We have a handful of freshwater pike fish. They're a little tricky. I wouldn't recommend pike fish right off the bat. To get to know seahorses and their relatives, they don't have much body fat and they need a lot of food and they like live food and they don't like a lot of competition and they don't like getting pushed around by any current. So they, they really like to best in their own tanks and they kind of make them filthy little wallows that they work in, but the, the, mixing them with other stuff usually doesn't work. Um, there is an oddball, so seahorses and pikefish are actually weirdly loosely related to sticklebacks. Uh, I don't know if anybody has ever seen a stickleback. They're not actually around here, but they're up north in kind of cold water. They look really weird and they make weird nests, round nests that they lay. But suffice it to say, there's a weird oddball that's found in Southeast Asia that is the bridge between those, and those are referred to as toothpicks. <laughs> that is actually the name. There's a crocodile toothpick. Uh, they're really, really tiny, and imagine all the problems of a pikefish, but make it about one inch, and find food that it will eat live food <laughs> that a one inch fish that is super tiny can eat. They're not easy. I wouldn't recommend it unless you have a big planted tank and then just throw in a bunch and then hope for the best. I don't, I don't know that you could ever even feed them. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's either gonna eat Daphne or Cyclops or whatever, dude, good luck. Fare thee well, friends. Good luck. Um, okay. So I actually posted one of the like little pictures of my in my eel post was an amnesite, and if anybody's familiar with amnesites, those are juvenile forms. Uh, you can actually find them here. If you go dragging around rivers and gravel, every once in a while you'll find a weird eel-looking thing, and it's got a weird kind of flat mouth. It really doesn't have a jaw. That is because it is a lamprey and it is filter feeding as its juvenile stage. So they actually kind of hang out in the, the sand and they filter feed. Eventually they get bigger and they become large leeches and they grab a hold of fish and they gnaw into them and drink their blood. And they have teeth all around and they don't actually have a, a workable jaw, which is what <coughs> makes them agnathids and are jawless fish. But they're weird and, but I would definitely consider them eel-like. I think that that checks all the boxes. Um, let's see. Now I'm going to discuss near eel-like creatures. Um, I think something that we oftentimes see is food, but we never actually think of introducing to our aquarium as a resident. Sometimes I'll see it in planted uh, tanks or black water tanks. Black worms are actually freshwater earthworms or freshwater annelids. They can actually live in our aquarium and do quite well. They actually are great in a densely planted tank because they can get up underneath in our root structure. And if you ever overpopulate, the fish can just kink, 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 kink. And every once in a while, they'll kind of come up. So if you're looking for an eel about yay long, then it's, it's a perfect little eel. I don't know that anyone will know the difference. Your secret will be safe with me. Um, some of the, one of the weirder things, uh, we actually had one of our admins keep a tank of these because mm -hmm. I mentioned it one time. So I'm going to pass it on to you so that I, I will justify it. Um, you can get medical leeches and every once in a while you can find leeches in with the blackworm shipments. Leeches actually live just fine on fish food. Like literally just sprinkle a little bit and they'll just be just fine and they'll kind of move around and they kind of slink out and probably not the best thing with fish in there but yeah you can keep a whole tank of really weird leeches and it's a fun weird tank and the medical leeches can get fairly sizey um six seven inches you know easy and then they can kind of stretch out but oh yeah like big thick thick things but if you were looking for something that was serpent-like, that kind of was really easy in a five gallon, I would definitely put you on a leech. 
Um, let's see. All right, so going the opposite way, uh, there's a thing called a rubber eel. Anybody ever come across rubber eels? Rubber eels are actually amphibians. Uh, it's just a long purple looking squirmy worm that has tiny little eyes and a weird little mouth. But they actually breathe air. Um, they'll absorb like oxygen through their skin. They actually come from South America, Colombia. Um, they're typhon, typhon, typhonectes natans, which is a Sicilian. They're oftentimes we don't normally come across Sicilians. Usually, whenever we're talking about amphibians, we will talk about salamanders and newts, and we'll talk about frogs and toads, and then that other thing. That other thing is the Sicilians. Believe it or not, there's a whole bunch of them, but usually they live down underneath, like in in the dirt. So did. Weirdly, they don't show really well when you put them into a zoo. You go, no, there's a big tub of dirt. There's a whole bunch of them in there. And they go, are you sure? And you go, yeah, yeah, they're in there. And they go, that sucks. <laughs> it's the worst, worst exhibit in a zoo whatsoever. Dude, because they basically just burrow around. You've got a large worm that's an amphibian. But the aquatic one does really well. We started importing them. And everybody kind of, once you start dealing with something that doesn't have legs and arms, we oftentimes think that that's a primitive version. So we naturally go, the Sicilians must be early amphibians. And then, you know, they became really smart and they got out of water. Right. Well, the problem was is whenever random QB gets one, he gets a big one. You know, it's two and a half, three foot. And he's got it for about two, three months. And then all of a sudden, he's got two of them in the tank. And the other one's about eight inches. Wait a minute. QB only bought one. Amphibians lay eggs. You all know how frogs and salamanders reproduce, right? I mean, Sicilians are advanced. So they actually have a weird cloaca in which the female it becomes impregnated and the offspring hatches in that weird primitive placenta and it will actually chew on the lining and feed itself and grow to a, almost six to eight inches before it's actually birthed, which has caused us to look again at whether or not the Sicilian is the primitive of the amphibians or it's opposite. Sicilians are super cool and if you can get a rubber eel, get one. It is one of the funnest weirdos that you can put in a tank. And you feed them shrimp pellets and they will love you to death. I have had no no issues with those over many, many years. I think Chris has got some. Um, let's see, and on that route, uh, there's a weirdo that's found around here that's called an amphiuma. Sometimes they have two toes, sometimes they have three toes. There's a whole different species um, by the amount of toes. It's kind of got two line, tiny little arms and they've got really sharp teeth. They bite and they will draw blood. I remember the first time I caught one, I thought it was a snake and all of a sudden it was really squishy and slimy and I pulled it out having no idea and it turned around and it just laid into me and dude just laid my hand wide open they bite I, I heard that and I was like it's an amphibian got to bite you know oh yeah well, once you get a three foot one man and it's attached to you <laughs> you start reassessing your your opinion on amphibians and, and biting you. Um, sirens are another you know uh, especially the dwarf siren the lesser siren the greater might be a little bit problem and uh, you'd have to have a big tank but you know they're both they're all found around here locally um, usually you can find them for sale if you kind of hunt and pack um, they're an interesting you know kind of addition especially to a native tank um, all right and if we're really wild a field and we're really going down the serpent route then we can talk about the Vietnamese tentacled snake. They actually grab 
plants and they actually have two long tentacles that come off their nose and they are actually, they'll basically snag guppies. They work really great in a planted tank and you get about two or three of them in there, they're really cool. Uh, we've got a zoo in San Antonio that is reproducing them and it's like won a bunch of awards because it breeds them so often. But a cool snake and it used to be in like they'd come in in bags, dried bags, and every once in a while one would live. Um, the other oddball is the Javan file snake or an elephant trunk snake. They really require a lot of like really soft water, but their skin is insane. It looks all wrinkly. They're super neat. Dude, another weird serpent if you're looking for a fresh one. Um, and on that, I would be remiss if I did not mention Hydropus simpiri, commonly known as the Lake Tall Snake, or Garmin's Sea Snake. It is the Philippine Freshwater Sea Snake. It, it, we just followed that, right? Okay. So sea snakes are actually poisonous. They're part of the Alapid group. They are highly venomous. So Lake Tall actually used to be a lagoon, and the sea snakes would be common in there. Well, as the island slowly lifted up, it caught the snakes in there and as the island kept lifting rain kept coming in and salt kept going out and over the last five six hundred years it has become fully fresh how that differs from its other relatives right over this is probably one of the fastest versions of speciation we have ever seen on our planet and it's been a note of study so it's well worth it at least to investigate, I think it would be super cool to have a freshwater sea snake. I'm not gonna lie. Um, oh, overall, with a lot of eels, I will recommend to tops. I cannot stress this enough. Put tops on everything. You think that those are glass tops are, are nice? Then put as much gravel as you can on top of those. They will get out. <laughs> Dude, if you walk back there and you see our eels in our tank, look at the top of it. It's got gravel bags all over it. Dude, those things will push them things open. The amount of very dry spiny eels that we have found outnumbers all the other jumpers that we could ever have. Um, so yes, cover those tanks. Um, feeding. I usually, a lot of times with wild eels, figure out what the shop is feeding them and try to kind of baby them at first. You know, I usually really kind of will, I usually with, with uh, a lot of the, uh, the fire eels, I'll feed them earthworms. They just love earthworms, man. You just go up to Academy and get your little tub of earthworms and you pull it out and you show them on the glass and you just walk them right up and they'll take it right out of your hand. But to take the time to kind of train it and then every time you come up it's going to naturally go up there but if you keep just dumping them in and, and all of a sudden the other fish come running the eel's going to run away he's going to be like dude i don't want any a part of that huge fighting madness up there no way dude and then he doesn't realize that that's his food time so he'll slowly kind of get scared of you coming up because that triggers all this aggressive behavior that is you know basically stressing him out so take the time a month or two worth of you investing will make that a 30-year fish as opposed to it starving in six months because he's not getting that good. Um, let's see. Hiding. Eels hide. Did, in the wild, they look like worms. Did worms get eaten? Did, they're naturally going to hide. So you, most of the eels that you're going to be kind of hunting in the hobby are probably going to hide most of the time. Really, uh, we're, they're going to get under the substrate, they're going to get under rocks, uh, under logs. The most of the, like, the experience that you're going to have with the eels is probably a feeding time. So kind of look forward to that as that time to interact with the fish. You know, this is your opportunity to really bond. And the more that he connects food with you, every time that you or another human comes up to the tank, they immediately come out and go, hey, it's food time, right? So now all of a sudden, the weird thing that always hides is actually coming out. So, yeah, win-win. 
Um, think about the eel. Think about things that are going to cause problems with the eel. You know, do we want a large placo in here with these eels? No, because the eels generally lay around, so do that placo is going to start rasping on the eel. So choose tank mates carefully. And honestly, I cannot stress enough, when you start thinking about an eel and you really go, I'm committed to getting an eel, to build the tank around the eel. Think about what fish are found in its native environment and pick fish that are naturally found around it. You're going to have an easier time and everybody's going to get along. They're trying to make a fire eel work in a Central American Jack Dempsey tank is going to be insane. It's never going to work. You're going to have problems. They're going to be fighting. Nobody's going to be happy. Um, and groupings. Most eels, weirdly, can be grouped up together. Like, so if you want fire eels, then at some point, the size tank that it takes to have one fire eel at full size versus the size tank that it takes to have six, probably pretty close. Literally, it's just gonna be a little bit more filtration. So to try to kind of go and bulk up, so that way, it actually, once one eel comes out to eat, guess what all the other eels do? They go, dude, it's food time, dude. Then they all come running. Whereas if you just got the single eel, he, he doesn't have any direction. So a lot of times the larger group that you have, the better off you're gonna end up being. It's gonna be more successful, especially as a showpiece in your, tank, in your home. Um, and honestly, you know, kind of analyze cost. The cost the eels can cost a big range. You know, you get little yellow tail spiny eels and they're like 10, 15 bucks, you know, up to, you know, some xanthic massis and bellus unicolor that are 700 to 1,000, you know, it can really vary. So, you know, kind of do some research and decide on what kind of eel, what kind of care, what kind of water you want to have, and yeah, kind of really build your eel tank. Um, I think that's about it. Does anybody got any questions? I'm happy to get, get my nickels worth. Maintenance. <laughs> Maintenance. Okay. Um, I, so with a lot of small eels, I think really any sort of like filtration, you know, will work just fine. I would be wary about doing any gravel backing. Um, you either are going to suck them or you're going to come down and pinch down on them. I would probably... If I was using a gravel back, I'd put a net and a rubber band at the end of the gravel back, and I would get down there with my hand and rough it up and suck it up as I was going. So that way, if the eel comes starting out, he's not going to go up the intake, and you're not going to pitch down on him. Does that make sense? That's how I would probably attack, like uh, cleaning substrate. Um, as far as maintenance. I mean, they're generally pretty, like, beefy eaters, especially like these. So you're going to want big water changes and big filters. You know, uh, I would probably hammer down on, like, bio and mechanical and then purigen. That would be my, like, main three. I'd probably ditch carbon, but I generally ditch carbon on most of my tanks. So, you're a carbon person, I, sorry. I think it's junk space. I think it's junk space. I think it's better with bio or mechanical. I, like if you're setting up a tank, cool, dude. You got carbon. I just, I, it ends up just being dead space in the filter. And I'm like, dude, filter space is a premium. Dude, I want it doing exactly what I want it to do. Dude. See, Dominic knows. <laughs> Preaching the choir. And then you forget about it. Why is it even in there? Yeah. And then it becomes bio because it's all covered with junk. And you're like, all right, well, why did I just have bio? You're like, eh. Eh. It's just wasted space. Uh, anything else? Um, being scaleless, um, I'm assuming they're going to have more, um, be more sensitive to certain medications. Yes. Yeah, they will definitely. And it depends on, on the eel. Like some eels do have scales, some of them don't. 
It just depends on the species. Like, you know, the fire eels actually have really fine scales. Um, just depends. But I would probably treat most eels, most of them are not going to be reproduced in the hobby, so they're all going to be wild caught. And it, I kind of have moved, like there used to be this kind of idea that like scaleless fish were really sensitive. I would almost move that to wild caught fish. Like I kind of regard all wild caught fish as sensitive. I generally would only dose half dosage, you know, stuff like that. And that's on any wild caught fish. I, I just have always found that to be the case, you know. It's like the difference between tank-raised cardinals or, you know, kind of hobby bred cardinals versus green neons. Green neons are way touchy. You, they, they, you blink at them hard and they'll, they'll all grow. You're like, dude, damn you, damn you. <laughs> I think that's why we don't see splash tetras in our hobby, in our area. I don't know why, but dude, I just don't ever see it. We got a big shipment of slash tetras from our last uh, Peru order. Uh huh. All dead in the month. Yeah. 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 I think Never did. they like really, really soft water. But I mean, the same thing as rummies. Honestly, like I had a. Green, green over here? What? No. I mean, like. Anything will get used to water when you get back I slowly. I. I would say so, but I think, so, so I've got a lot of theories on soft versus hard. Um, the issue is bacteria. Remember what happens below a uh, pH of six? Nothing. There is no bacteria. There is no nitrogen cycle. Your fish produce ammonium. Ammonium is actually the safe form as opposed to toxic ammonia. So, it only stays at ammonia. So in the Amazon, these fish don't ever deal with bacteria. This is why whenever you're breeding quarries and stuff like that, back in the old days, they would, you know, as soon as you had eggs, they would tell you, dump all the methylene blue because you have fungus. Down in the Amazon, they don't ever deal with fungus because it's too low a pH. Dude, it's all acidic. They never have had to deal with that, so they've never evolved the protein layers on the eggs to deal with it. I think that this is one of the reasons that discus end up fading over here in hard water, is because the bacteria start in getting in their skin. That down in the Amazon, there's no bacteria, so they don't ever have to deal with it. So even if you can acclimate them, I think it's just long term the bacteria load is something that they've just not evolved to. And most people sell fish and they're not going to set up just a tank. Yeah. And it's all the filtration system to keep that water exactly. at what needs to be. Now, I will say that I have a, a client, one of my clients, because I, I work here, but I do maintenance all over. And um, I actually bring in RODI, and it's they've got a school of almost 70 uh, rummy nose that's in a silly acrylic circle those things have cherry red heads and you look ripping and i just do 50 percent water changes every time and i just tote in rodi 100 percent rodi and dude, that's all they get and dude, they love me to death and dude, the wood just drops the ph and dude, yeah we're all good i have no dude, those things are two and a half inches and they've been around for almost four or five years People go, nah, -uh. <laughs> dude. Look at them. Those things are like, like piranhas, man. Yeah, you, you couldn't kill them if you wanted to. But do you add tap water to that? I bet you they'd be dead in no time. Because they kept having problems. They that that client is right on Clear Lake. So do, and they were using well water. And I think that they were we were getting salt water intrusion. So they were actually not only hard water, but do brackish and I was like dude this is never gonna work never gonna work and they were like well I want rummy notes and they're like fine dude, I'm gonna have to just toad in water but dude it looks great I, they never have any issues now but yeah it's it, and at that point you're attacking the filtration a lot different because then you don't need bio once you get below six the bio is just a waste again dude same space. Now you're just mechanical. 
You just do water change. Zoom in. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? Is choice of substrate important? I mean, I would probably generally, if it's going to burrow, and especially any burrowing species, I would go for a softer substrate. I would watch out for any sort of like really sharp volcanic kind of stuff. Um, but generally speaking, I would go for the softer the better. Um, feel it in your hand. Feel if it's not sharp. It's got really sharp edges, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, put coolie loaches in granite or, you know, horse face loaches and they're just going to just shred their face every time they dive in the substrate. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, uh, substrate's a good, good choice. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Well, hey, thank you all for coming to my TED Talk on eels. Hopefully you guys walk away. We're eel wise. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, come up, feel free to look. Uh, and yeah, uh, happy to answer any more questions.